In this episode of Slow Boat Sailing, Anna, Linus, and Daily Dog visit Fakarava to wait out a violent weather front, and you will see the top four things to do when you stop in Fakarava. Subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing and hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next video. We feature our round-the-world adventure and the stories of the most interesting sailors in the world. are here in Fakarava and this is the second largest atoll in the Tuamotus after Rangiroa and uh, it also has the largest pass and the largest village so a lot of people stop here uh, even in the low season right now. The Fakarava is a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site and it has uh, some fabulous diving, I am told, although I'm not a diver. Uh, but uh, you have to enjoy diving with sharks, who I'm told are very well fed here in Fakarava and will probably not bother you. We're going to count down the top four things to do in Fakarava. And the first one is one that you want to do if you have a boat. Obviously, if you flew in, you won't want to do this. But if you have a boat, provisioning, getting fuel and food is probably a, one of the best things you can do in Fakarava, the most civilized or one of the most civilized of the two Motus. Getting fuel is a little more complicated than just going to the gas pump because there is no gas station in Fakarava. There's a ship that comes in most weeks and the locals can tell you when it's due in. You want to make sure that you get to that ship as soon as it docks and buy some fuel. You may have to buy a minimum quantity. I think it's about 200 liters, but they might sell you less than 200 liters depending on how generous they're feeling. Another alternative is you can get fuel from Fakarava Yacht Services who tends to hoard fuel between the times that the ship goes in and there'll be an extra service charge for that. Now the fuel is going to be expensive. It's going to be more expensive than Tahiti prices, probably more expensive than Marquesas prices, but there's only one other island in the two Motus that you can buy fuel and going from island to island in the two Motus is tricky and very difficult. So you never know uh, if you'll be able to get to another island because of the problems of tide getting uh, in and out during daylight and the variabilities of weather the passes make going from one atoll in the two motus to another tricky so my advice is if you need fuel in Fakarava get it if you think you might need fuel I would say get it one thing you can get in Fakarava or the two motus is large quantities of water so if you think you might need to fill your water tanks definitely fill them before you leave the Marquesas don't leave that to the two motus because that can really shorten your cruise if you don't have a water maker. The two Motus, as a general rule, lack freshwater sources and they get all their water from rainwater, which means they're always water rationing. I'm at the beautiful Avaiki Pension and Pearl Farm, and this is one of the many pearl farm tours you can do on Fakarava, but like most things in French Polynesia, the tours run mostly during the week and most things close after noon on a Saturday. One of the benefits of going there on the weekend and not having the formal tour is you don't have to worry about the sales pitch for the pearls. The second best thing to do in Fakarava is rent a bike and see the sights both north and south of town.
Here I am on the, a lovely pink sand beach on the windward side of Fakarava. The, some folks will tell you that you can only find pink sand beaches in Fakarava if you go on expensive tours, but this is actually about between uh, PK3 and PK4, that is four, uh, three to four kilometers from the center of town. So you could walk it or you could bike it the way I've been doing it and enjoy the beautiful pink sand beach and see the breakers. sure what this uh, big tower is but it certainly is a landmark that you can make out uh, from the sea on the north side of Fakarava and uh, it is a prominent one this is kind of shaped like a Mayan pyramid uh, it could be some type of lighthouse I'm not sure uh, there's a ladder to the top except it's kind of broken and kind of wobbly. So if you have guests flying in or crew flying out, behind me is a dock to land your dinghy if you wanted to take your uh, airport guests to uh, the airport by boat and there is at least one mooring that I've seen here so you don't even have to drop an anchor if you would like to drop them off yourself. It's about four kilometers to the airport from the dock in Rodova, the dock in the village. six flights a week here from the Fakarava airport so it's a pretty good place to have a crew come on or depart if you want to stay in the two motus for a while. meter light is probably the first thing you will see if you are passing by Fakarava at night. It puts out a white beacon and it is between kilometer 8 and 9 north of the village. Nearly to the pass, kilometer 9. I'm standing before the North Pass of Fakarava. Uh, this is the widest pass in the Tuamotus and by virtue of that it may be the easiest. It is certainly very well marked. Uh, it does have a, a green marker at its entrance. It does get fairly strong currents so it's probably worthwhile to time the currents here. Uh, the currents are clocked at six knots. When we came in just before slack, our highest current was about three and a half to four knots. No, it's, it's calm. It's kind of the, the same as when we entered.
when the front did come through, I was pretty freaked out because what used to be a protected waters became a lee shore. But thankfully, the mooring lines held and we survived to sail another day. On Friday, second day of the front, this fish came and died in our dinghy. I was too afraid to swim in Fakarava because I saw these little sharks that are looking at the uh, dead fish. But later on, I was told they were remora. My fear of sharks didn't translate to my crew member, and she did a lot of diving. It was a wild ride on the mooring, and I probably would have departed had Anna been aboard at that time, just for comfort's sake, but I didn't feel it was safe to depart the mooring on my own because I didn't think I could run back from the bow to the stern and get the motor running fast enough before we would be dangerously close to the lee shore. After the front pass, Anna went on a dive of the south pass of Fakarava. The dive company picked her up from Contango, and it was an all-day trip. It was a few hundred dollars, I think, and she got a little bit of a discount because she's just a poor backpacker. That is the number one thing you should do if you visit Fakarava, of course, if you dive, and are not afraid of sharks like I am. Anna took some marvelous dive footage and she did not lose any limbs from the sharks. On the day she dived the South Pass, it still was pretty squally and uh, nasty looking weather and would not have been a good day to sail. There are a lot of anchoring restrictions around the South Pass and there are only a few moorings near the dive shop and those fill up very quickly. So uh, you may have trouble getting your own boat there and some cases uh, hiring a dive operator may make it a lot easier to do it. Even if you have the full setup and a, a good dinghy, you will probably find it hard to anchor. Most of the anchoring is in kind of crushed coral bottoms, which has very poor holding. And there are also a lot of anchoring restrictions in Fakarava, places you can't anchor. So for instance, the pink sand island that everybody talks about you can't anchor anywhere near that. So Anna has been sailing about halfway around the world. She started out in her native Netherlands with a friend, and she sailed with him to the Caribbean, where he stopped his trip. After that, she joined a large boat that had kids and helped out with uh, taking care of the kids in addition to the sailing duties. Uh, so she was pretty eager, I think, to have a, you know a boat that had less responsibilities uh, beyond sailing uh, when she came aboard Contango. You know, normally I don't have the crew have any really responsibilities when we're in port. Only I typically only ask them to, to maybe help me with anchoring if we're going to be moving around. And their primary responsibility is to keep a good watch, uh, looking out for other boats, making sure that the boat is on course, and keeping a watch log. You know, I've been uh, I found it's, uh, it's a good idea to give the, the crew a, a watch log and to emphasize how it's important it is to keep a, a straight course and how that gets us into port quick more quickly and uh, keeps us out of trouble. Definitely the extending of passages in my experience. So most of the time with our past crew members for Anna, uh, they didn't have a lot to do in port and they enjoyed themselves and did a lot of sightseeing. And I think that's a lot of what they're there for because they want to see the sights in these uh, exotic locations that we visit. So at Slow Boat Sailing, we 100% support all our living and boating expenses through our full-time jobs. I teach, and my wife has a full-time job and only gets off four weeks of vacation per year. She comes on the boat about two weeks per year, 
and I sail during the summers when I have time off. I'm in the Northern Hemisphere, so the Northern Hemisphere summer is the cruising season in the South Pacific. And I detail this in my book, How to Sail Around the World Part-Time. Unfortunately, maintaining a YouTube channel is not free in the sense that you have to pay for your camera gear, you have to pay for internet and foreign ports, you have to pay for extra storage and computers that are fast enough to process video files. Uh, the storage demands itself are very large. Uh, we bought two drones to support the YouTube channel, and we also um, bought several cameras, the action camera that uh, Anna used for example, and uh, many other accessories such as tripods and stabilizers so that we can give you the best video. But all that costs money and we barely make any money. Uh, but we ask our viewers to help out uh, through Patreon. And that makes a big difference. You know, from my background, I think if, you know, if the, the market can't support something, then maybe it shouldn't go on. And so the support that we get from our patrons uh, makes a big difference. And one of the ways we say thank you is we give audiobooks of uh, How to Sail Around the World Part-Time or Sailing to Treasure Island by Captain Vaughn to all our patrons and we give more books to uh, higher level patrons and people that pledge at the associate producer level uh, you see in the credits of these videos. So I'd encourage you to go down to patreon.com slash slowboatsailing. Links are on the channel page and also in the description and uh, make a pledge if you love to see our content. I think we do something different here at Slow Boat Sailing that we don't exclusively have a vlog like this episode, uh, but we also have uh, videos of the most interesting sailors in the world and newsworthy things that are of interest to pe people that want to do long distance cruising in their own sailboat. with the dive footage i'm gonna give you a sample of sailing to treasure island by captain jc voss the cruise of the zora annotated which is available on audible for free if you sign up for their monthly service link in the description and if you sign up as a patron as a free gift to all patrons at patreon.com slash sailing Chapter 1. A Chance of a Lifetime, 7 million pounds sterling. My seafaring life commenced in the year 1877, when I was quite a young man, and was spent up to the time I sailed the Zora in large sailing vessels, during which period I have filled all sorts of position from deck boy up to master. Throughout all those years, I certainly would not have believed that a vessel so small as the Zora could live through a heavy gale at sea, and naturally enough, should not have a thought of attempting a long sea voyage in any small craft, had it not been for a gentleman whose name was George Hafner, an American citizen. In the summer of 1897, when I was sitting comfortably in an easy chair in the Queen's Hotel, Victoria, British Columbia, a gentleman stepped up to me saying, Are you Captain Voss? I replied in the affirmative. He then introduced himself as Mr. Hafner, handing me at the same time a letter saying that it was from an old friend of mine whose death had taken place at sea just 14 days previously, and with whom he he had stayed during his last moments. The letter ran as follows. Dear friend John, you will be surprised to learn that I am now lying on my deathbed. Yes, dear friend, we are at present a long way out on the Pacific Ocean, and I shall never be able to see land any more, but shall be buried at sea like a dog, and the Pacific Ocean will be my grave. The bearer of this note is Mr. George Hafner, who knows the position where the great treasure lies on Cocos Island. Believe in him, and he will make you a rich man. Excuse my short note because I am very weak. Kindly remember me to all my old friends and believe me. Your dying friend, Jim Dempster. About five months previous to this meeting with Hafner, a Victoria sealing schooner of about 75 tons 
had been chartered by several enterprising men of victoria of whom dempster was one for the purpose of sailing down to cocos island to make a search for great treasure supposed to be buried on that island hafner was in a position of a permit issued by the costa rica government to secure the treasure if found by him he stated when this sealing schooner the aurora arrived at cocos island he had already been on the island for nine months during which time he had vigorously searched for the treasure and had located it surprised at this i asked him dubiously why he had not taken the treasure back to victoria and the aurora he explained that having arrived at cocos island by the costa rica supply boat which undertakes the trip every six months to supply the guard on the island with provisions he met the crew of the aurora not knowing anything of their intentions besides not liking the captain he did not feel disposed to disclose the secret as to where the treasure was buried he continued meanwhile the crew of the aurora worked with all their might and made excavations in many places without however having the lightest success finally the men got tired and dissatisfied at having come on a wild goose chase besides their provisions ran short so they were compelled to return to victoria giving me passage at the same time shortly after our departure from cocos island dempster became ill and as a passenger on board i volunteered to nurse him i did all i possibly could for him but he grew worse and worse so that it was soon plain to me that he would shortly succumb not knowing anybody in victoria and not being a sailor myself i thought of getting in touch with the responsible person in victoria who would join me in an expedition to cocos island to bring away the treasure so i decided to confide the news that i had found the treasure to dempster greatly surprised at this he almost gained new life but realized later that his end was near and that he himself could not profit by my communication i then asked dempster to give me the name of a reliable man in victoria who would be in a position to procure for me a suitable vessel and crew with which to sail to cocos island and carry off the treasure he mentioned your name and wrote the letter which i have just handed to you because i have found from the day i first met dempster on cocos island till he died that he was straightforward and a reliable man i have decided to place confidence in you i now ask can you and will you procure for me a vessel and fit her out properly sail with me to cocos island and assist me to put treasure on board and take it to victoria as compensation i offer you one-third of whatever we may secure of the treasure which would be the same as my own share as we have to hand over one-third to the costa rica government to my query hafner then explained that the treasure was valued at over seven million pounds sterling so that each share would amount to say two million three hundred thirty three thousand Okay, thanks for listening to the audio sample. You can get that at Audible or at patreon.com slash sailing. Links in the description. Here's back to the action, Fakarava, and a preview of the next episode. stopped in Fakarava because a front was coming and it was going to hit Tahiti and come in our path before we got to Tahiti and so the front brings squalls, 30 knot winds and uh, rough seas and so we waited it out here in Fakarava and we arrived here on Tuesday and our hope is to leave on Monday of the following week. showers today are the tail end of the front and we're going to have beautiful weather tomorrow to go through the pass and go to Tahiti. 
subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing, and hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next video. We feature our round-the-world adventure and the stories of the most interesting sailors in the world.